Are you ready to conquer the high seas with the most epic naval game ever? Then you've come to the right place. This video is sponsored by World of Warships, and I've got some exciting news for you. World of Warships is a free-to-play game available on PC, with new content released every month, such as new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. You can enjoy a fresh gameplay experience with stunning graphics that will make you feel like you're in the real deal. Dynamic weather and textures enhance the realism of the game's seas, with more than 40 unique maps to choose from. You can always find a battle that suits you. Plus, you can command a massive naval fleet with over 500 ships across 10 different nations. And speaking of ships, you get to choose from multiple ship classes, including battleships, destroyers, cruisers, submarines, and even aircraft carriers. With each ship being hyper-accurate to the real thing, you'll feel like a real commander on the high seas. And guess what? World of Warships is also available on consoles as well, so that's brilliant. But wait, there's more. With a large active community, you can join clans, compete in competitive game modes, and chat with fellow wargamers on their official Discord. And the best part, as I said, you can enjoy it all for free. Now, I know what you're thinking, <laughs> that sounds too good to be true, Simon, but it's not. And I've got some exclusive rewards just for you as well. All you need to do is download the game using the first link in the description below, and during registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get your hands on some premium rewards, including doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a ship. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to dominate the seas with World of Warships, and don't forget, link in the description below, and I'll see you out there, Captain. Countless films produced in the United States feature the use of rather expensive military equipment and often real-world military personnel. Given the extreme expense of all of this using things paid for by the US taxpayer to benefit for-profit companies, how is that allowed? Further, how are projects that the military uh, will support selected? Can just any US citizen apply for use of such equipment and personnel for their particular project to make it all fair? And just how much does this cost the US taxpayer in cases like, for example, the recent wildly profitable Top Gun Maverick? And why? And how did it all get started? As the why, as William Brady, one time head of the National Association of the Motion Picture Industry, wrote in 1917 to US President Woodrow Wilson, the motion picture can be made the most wonderful system for spreading the national propaganda at little or no cost. Fast forwarding to the mid 20th century, in the United States Office of War Information even had a Bureau of Motion Pictures which reviewed over 1,600 film scripts in the United States during World War II. As to why, well, once again, as the Bureau's head, Elmer Davis, stated, the easiest way to inject a propaganda idea into most people's minds is to let it go through the medium of an entertainment picture when they do not realize they're being propagandized. Beyond propaganda, a second commonly stated reason as to why this is a benefit to the military is in recruitment. That said, it may surprise you to learn that despite what almost every media outlet says even the original Top Gun actually didn't have much of any measurable effect on recruitment numbers when you actually look at the data, as we'll get into in a bit. This now brings us to how it all got started. While going all the way back to 1910, there were examples of films that featured military equipment being used, it was in the lull between World War I and World War II that the relationship between Hollywood and the military became fixed with the 1927 flick Wings. With a cast that included about 3,000 infantry and a bunch of US military planes and pilots, Wings not only won the Best Picture Oscar, but it showed how cooperation between the military and Hollywood provided huge benefits to both. Hollywood created an authentic military experience at a discount rate and enjoyed commercial and critical success. And the military had what was for them essentially a great recruitment film displayed in theaters across the country. They also had an invaluable tool for changing public perception of a given war and the potential righteousness of it, as well as being able to influence perception of what it was like to be a soldier and the idealized version of that person and life. As such, during and after World War II, Hollywood war movies nearly universally featured brave men whose causes were just and successful, even if they perished, with notable titles like 1945's They Were Expendable, The 1949's Sands of Iwo Jima, the 1951 The Flyag Leathernecks, 1953's Starlag 17, The Bridges at Toko Ri in 1954, The Longest Day in 1962, and The Great Escape in 1963. Likewise, films like From Here to Eternity, Mr. Roberts, South Pacific, and Operation Petticoat put a positive human face on the war and its servicemen. And it is precisely this that led author Lauren Sood to coin the phrase mutual exploitation. According to Sood, oh, when I was getting my film degree, it suddenly occurred to me that people in the US had never seen the US lose a war in film, and when President Johnson said we can go into Vietnam and win, they believed him because they'd seen 50 years of war movies that were positive. Speaking of Vietnam, things changed dramatically in the negative direction in the aftermath in terms of public perception of the US military and government for pretty obvious reasons. Naturally, the Department of Defense was keen on rehabilitating that image and turned to their friends in Hollywood for help, with it generally noted that the phenomenal film Top Gun was the most successful of all of this, though not without some controversy in the aftermath. Tom Cruise himself rang in on this in an interview in 1990, stating, Some people felt that Top Gun was a right-wing film to promote the Navy, and a lot of kids loved it. But I want the kids to know 
know that that's not the way war is, that Top Gun was just an amusement park ride, a fun film with a PG-13 rating that was not supposed to be reality. That's why I didn't go on and make Top Gun 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. That would have been irresponsible. And well, now that is awkward. In any event, so important was this relationship between the Department of Defense and film studios that since the middle of the century, the Pentagon has had a permanent liaison to deal with studios with such individuals over time, including Donald Barrack, Philip Strube, David Evans, as well as countless others from specific branches of the military to further consult. A big part of these individuals' job is reviewing scripts to see if they meet potential selection criteria. As to how they decide what to accept, former Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Alan Ortiz rings in, they're really is no hard equation when it comes to determining if the Department of Defense is going to support a particular project, but there are some core requirements that the production has to meet. The biggest things we look for are verifiable proof of funding and distribution. We're looking for reasonable authenticity in any production that we're supporting when it comes to scripted productions. Obviously, with unscripted projects, that's different, but we strive to get things as close as we possibly can. We're really looking to tell that story and to articulate, project, and protect the image of the U.S. military and the men and women who serve. Chief of Entertainment at the Department of Defense, Glenn Roberts, further chimes in, We do not provide support to shows that depict storylines that violate military policy. For example, there's a show on TV that shows uniformed men and women conducting law enforcement activities like kicking doors in and arresting drug dealers. We don't support that particular show because that is against the Posse Comitatus Act, which is that U.S. active duty military service members do not conduct domestic law enforcement. We're really trying to ensure that we stay inside the lines of integrity, but we're perfectly fine with fictional approaches. We work with Marvel movies. Movies. There's no Hulk, there's no Thor, Captain Marvel, or Iron Man, but we're still happy to support those movies. We're really looking to ensure the integrity of the institution as a whole. They even go so far as to require any extras portraying military personnel being up to snuff. For example, in one section of the 84-page agreement between the Department of Defense and the makers of the smashingly good Top Gun Maverick, it states, in order to get the Department of Defense support, the production company will cast actors, extras, doubles, and stunt personnel portraying service members who conform to individual military service regulations governing age, height, weight, uniform, grooming, appearance, and conduct standards. So going back to Roberts, he goes on that despite these stringent requirements, the film does not have to be a love letter to the military. It doesn't mean that there can't be a bad person, a villain per se, who is in uniform, as long as it actually upholds the integrity of the men and women in uniform and the ability to do their job. Humor is good. We laugh at ourselves. We're happy to laugh at ourselves. Like I said, it's not unheard of to have a bad guy or bad girl, so to speak, in a villain's role. Go back to the funding requirement. Roberts elaborates, There's a lot of folks that want to come shoot the movie, but they don't have funding or they don't have distribution. We need to make sure that we're good stewards of the taxpayers' money and their resources. We only utilize those resources and make them available for things that are really going to be seen in the public eye. That said, as noted by the aforementioned David Evans, the Department of Defense also makes an effort to work with many student filmmakers. Quote, The services might want to do something because it's no sweat to them to help a student along. And on this one and many documentaries, quote, Nine times out of ten, what they are seeking for is access to individuals and access to installations just to get supplemental footage. And most of this is just footage of the military doing its normal thing, so it's not incurring any additional costs or effort. Just someone wanting to come film it and possibly talk to service members about something they do or have done. That said, the documentaries do usually have to have funding and distribution secured for what they are doing. But in some cases, they may still get a pass if the project looks right and the individuals involved are known and respected. With Phil Strub chiming in, sometimes we'll ease over to, okay, it looks legit, and yes, you've got a really good reputation within the community, we'll go ahead and support this one. On top of this, as motion picture and television entertainment liaison and army officer Todd Bresciale states, they also look at what their equipment is going to be used for. For example, if the studio, to quote him, just wanted cheap props to essentially, that would typically get rejected out of turn. Further, if the equipment they were asking for in a given scene was wildly unrealistic as to the way it might actually be used in real life, in his words, quote, bringing a knife to a gunfight, he'd also potentially reject at least use of that specific equipment on those grounds. It's also noted that during any filming and review of footage, they are looking to make sure that nothing classified at all is given away anywhere, even unintentionally. Going back to Top Gun Maverick, this is allegedly one factor as to why the F-35 was not used for the mission, along with the fact that it's a single-seat aircraft so they would have had to CGI the actors into the jets instead of actually being there, as was possible with the F-A-18s used in most of the flight sequences. It's also potentially noteworthy that the F-35's estimated cost per hour is almost three times that of the F-A-18, 
Play 18, which may or may not have also played into things, as we'll get into when we discuss the costs of everything later and the interesting discrepancy from what is publicly stated by the Department of Defense versus the actual cost when you dig a little deeper. In any event, if the script passes the initial screening, it is then handed off to the appropriate liaison officers in respective branches of the military for actual approval or not, and for their own thoughts on the script and any changes they might recommend. This is not just to get the script final approval, but also sometimes just plain helpful ideas from the people in the military whose job it is to do the things depicted in the films. In fact, sometimes the filmmakers themselves will explicitly request thoughts on a given scene or sequence in a film to try and get it as accurate as possible, or see if the military professionals have a better idea than what's currently in the script for how to do something. Pertinent to the topic at hand, the entire plot of Top Gun Maverick was built off of ideas that came directly from the Navy, according to director Joseph Kaczynski. He states, he asked the Navy reps, what's the hardest, gnarliest, scariest mission you could ever imagine having to do with a naval aviator? The reps then began throwing out ideas, which he says he then just built the mission off of pretty much exactly as they suggested. The specific ideas were carrier launch, low-level ingress through a canyon defended by SAM, on a target that's jammed GPS, hit the target with a buddy laser system, and you've got a pull at the ends, and another SAM array waiting for you, and enemy aircraft patrolling the skies. Kaczynski goes on that the only suggestion he didn't take there for the mission was to make it night, as obviously that wouldn't exactly be very cinematic, though of course would have made it much more difficult for the pilots. We should also point out that during and after filming it would seem, at least based on the Top Gun Maverick agreement between the Department of Defense and the studio, the military generally requires that they get to review any changes to the script as well as to look over the footage before it's shown to the general public. Specifically, the agreement states, the production company must obtain in advance Department of Defense concurrence for any subsequent substantial changes proposed to the military depictions made to either the picture or the sound portions of the production before it is exhibited to the public. The production company agrees to involve the DOD project officer in these changes, including those that may be made during post-production. It also states, the production company shall provide the DOD and CNAF project officers with a viewing of the roughly edited but final version of the production, the rough cut, at a stage in editing when changes can be accommodated, but only to the extent required to allow the DOD to confirm that the tone of the military sequences substantially conforms to the agreed script treatment or narrative description, to preclude release or disclosure of sensitive, security-related or classified information, and to ensure that the privacy of DOD personnel is not violated. Should DOD determined that the material in the production comprises any of the preceding concerns, DOD will alert the production company of the material, and the production company will remove the material from the production." End quote. Speaking of security concerns, going back to the F-35 in the film, the agreement also states that F-35 Joint Program Office will have on-site program manager to conduct security review of all F-35 footage on board. Any footage deemed classified or sensitive will be deleted or turned over to the US Navy prior to debarking the ship. Further controversy comes from that if the military or some war isn't being painted in a light they like, even if extremely accurate to reality and real events, the use of military equipment and personnel will not be approved, or at least not without the studio changing the film in the way the Department of Defense wants. That said, contrary to what is sometimes implied, this isn't necessarily nefarious, often much more mundane. For example, in the original Top Gun, Maverick's lady love in the movie was supposed to be a fellow soldier, but such a romantic relationship was not allowed in real life, and thus the Department of Defense required that the script be changed to accommodate. Thus, the screenwriter simply rewrote the character of Charlotte Blackwood to be a civilian. Moving on to the 2002 film Wind Talkers, starring Nicolas Cage, about the real-life Navajo code talkers used during World War II, there were a handful of changes the Department of Defense wanted that the filmmakers weren't exactly pleased about, but nonetheless gave in. For starters, there was a scene in which one of the Marines, nicknamed The Dentist, is shown pulling the gold fillings out of a dead Japanese soldier's mouth. When the script was passed off to Captain Matt Morgan of the Mariner Corps, Morgan wrote in his feedback to Strub, this has to go. The activity is unmarine. I recommend these characters be looting the dead for intelligence or military souvenirs, swords, knives, field glasses. Loot is still not cool, but more realistic and less brutal. Seems reasonable enough. The ultimate feedback then to producer Terence Chang was, the dentist character displays distinctly unmarine behavior. He is in fact committing an atrocity. While I recognize the war in the Pacific was brutal, I don't see a need to portray a marine as a ghoul. There apparently was some back and forth arguing with this, with the writer of the film, Joe Batir, arguing this sort of looting and things of that nature did happen, which Morgan didn't deny. Again, attempting to be reasonable, Morgan further stated, listen, if you're gonna do something like this, is this gonna be something that's gonna be dealt with in the movie? 
because you don't deal with it. I mean, you just got a guy who shows up and he's doing it like he was washing his car or something. If you're going to portray this, let's deal with it. The why, the how, was it reciprocal? You know, because the Japanese were doing awful things to the Marines too. Ultimately, it was decided just to cut the scene, as was a scene where one of the Marines murders with a flamethrower a Japanese soldier who was trying to surrender. On this one, the screenwriters really wanted to keep the scene, owing to it being critical to show that the character in question was, to quote, damaged at that point by his experiences in the war. However, Bresciali explains, if you're going to show a soldier committing a war crime, then you're going to also need to show how the uniform code of military justice deals with that and the punishment that they would suffer, or at least ideally suffer. Again, the reality of the war in the Pacific was sometimes quite different from what the Department of Defense was willing to depict here. Perhaps the most controversial change, however, was a scene in which the soldiers are told that if it looks like they're going to be captured, they should kill their code talker rather than allow the enemy to take him captive. While you could see why the Department of Defense wouldn't want that in there, Chang stated, the whole movie was based on that assumption. We did talk to code talkers, and they said that was true. Why would they lie to me? On this point, former code talker John Brown Jr. stated, the Marine order was to let them shoot you if you were captured. That was war. We were obligated. Code talker Carl Gorman also stated the same, among several others. Congress even rang in on this when they awarded the Congressional Gold Medals to 29 code talkers with part of the legislation in the bill stating, some code talkers were guarded by fellow Marines whose role was to kill them in case of imminent capture by the enemy. Despite all of this, the Marine Corps still denied this was ever actually a thing and would not allow it to be put in the movie if the filmmakers wanted Department of Defense support for the film. Thus, a compromise was reached where the script was changed from ordering the soldiers to kill their code talker if captured to, under no circumstances can you allow your code talker to fall into enemy hands. Your mission is to protect the code at all costs. Do you understand? More or less implying the same thing without explicitly saying it. Moving on from there, Kevin Costner's 13 days covering the Cuban Missile Crisis was reportedly denied military aid in the filmmaking because of how they depicted the generals being eager to invade Cuba, something based on well-documented real-world discussions. When the military requested changes to correct this perceived negative portrayal, the studio rejected the suggested changes and thus were denied the use of military equipment and personnel. For some movies, this would stop it from being made, given increased costs without Department of Defense support, but that was not the case for this film. Moving on from there, a rather surprising film that initially was going to get military support, but the Department of Defense ultimately pulled out of, was the 1996 blockbuster Independence Day. As to why, writer Dean Devlin states, their one demand was that we remove Area 51 from the film, and we didn't want to do that. So they withdrew their support. In a slightly more humorous example, according to David Robb's 2004 book, Operation Hollywood, in the James Bond film Goldeneye, the Department of Defense demanded the nationality of Admiral Chuck Farrell be changed from a U.S. admiral to a different nation, owing to perceived incompetence. The studio acquiesced and made him French. The problem was, the studio was also getting help from the French military. Goldeneye screenwriter Bruce Fairstein stated of this, When the French lent us the boat, they wanted to make sure that the French military was in no way made to look bad. When they lend you the toys, they want some say in how the toys are used. Thus, a further switch was made to make the Admiral Canadian. Moving on to Iron Man, Strub states that there originally was a scene in which a military officer was supposed to say they'd kill themselves for the opportunities Iron Man has. Strub recounts, it never got resolved until we were in the middle of filming. Now we're on the flight lines at Edwards Air Force Base and there's 200 people and the director and I are having an argument about this. He's getting redder and redder in the face and I'm getting just as annoyed. It was pretty awkward. And then he said angrily, well how about they'd walk over hot coals? I said, Fine. He was so surprised, it was that easy. Straub elaborates concerning such compromises, I think that's more the way these things go once the filmmakers understand that we're not out to undermine their art, but to try and come up with something that works for them. Oftentimes, it's something they haven't thought of, and they like it, and it makes it better. And that happens all the time. The greater news media never reports it, because it's not very sexy to say that things worked out. That said, it doesn't always work out. For example, in another Marvel film, The Avengers, Strub stated, We couldn't reconcile the unreality of this international organization and our place in it. To whom did S.H.I.E.L.D. answer? Did we work for S.H.I.E.L.D.? We hit that roadblock and decided we couldn't do anything. It's one thing, like in Transformers, where you have this unit of mostly soldiers and one airman and they report to the chairman. It's a fictional military organization, but it's not outside the system as compared to S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. is this all-powerful entity that, you know, nuke New York City. Thus, in the end, this was one of the few Marvel films that didn't get Department of Defense support, and instead the jets depicted in the film were simply computer generated. And I think we can all agree that that denial was warranted just based on the stupidity of the nuking in the first place. So this all brings us around to cost. So how much does this actually cost the US taxpayer? Well, in theory, 
nothing. Though there is a bit of controversy here in terms of some questionable accounting, as we'll get into in a bit. But in general, as the aforementioned Todd Brasale notes, every time you see a piece of military hardware that is not created through CGI, that cost is borne out by the production company unless a specific training mission was pre-scheduled and planned to be flown anyway. The production company would pay the hourly rate for that aircraft. As for the soldiers, soldiers are paid anyway. For instance, we shot a picture up in Canada and we brought in actual soldiers because they needed to be able to fly the Black Hawk helicopters. So they paid for the soldiers' transportation up there, they paid a rate field cost for the Black Hawks, they paid the hourly rate for the Black Hawks, and then they paid the per diem and hotel expenses for the service members who were on set. However, some have taken issue uh, with all of this even so. In particularly the seemingly generous nature at times, things could be lumped into training. For example, Strub states, The thing is, whether it's legitimate training or not isn't necessarily an exact science. For example, on the film set for the made-for-TV movie Vestige of Honor, he notes, I think there were Army National Guard helicopters involved. Watching them take off land, take off land, take off land, I thought this cannot be any meaningful training whatsoever. So I sidled over to their officer in charge and I said, well, I guess you're not getting much training today, are you? And he said, We've gotten more training this morning than a week at Fort Hood. I've got my refuelers here. I've got my emergency medical people here. This brings us to accounting and Top Gun Maverick. Going back to the 84-page agreement between the Department of Defense and the studio, consistent with a normal collaboration between the US military and a film studio, to quote the document, the production company will reimburse the US government for any additional expenses incurred as a result of the assistance rendered for the production of Top Gun Maverick. It's also been reported that the Department of Defense charged the studio $11,374 for each hour of flight time of the F-A-18s used in the film that couldn't be chalked up to training. So how much does an hour of flight time actually cost for the FA-18. According to the Department of Defense, exactly that amount, funnily enough. So, no problem there, right? Well, it would seem that that's not actually the real cost per hour of flying an FA-18. Not even close, actually, at least according to former FA-18 pilot and present-day advanced data and analytics consultant Brad Odom, as outlined in his completely unrelated 2016 report, Why Sloppy Accounting is Destroying the U.S. Fighter Inventory. In this one, his report has nothing to do with Hollywood and is simply criticizing the Department of Defense's accounting when it comes to stating operating cost rates for military aircraft and how this is negatively impacting decisions made by commanding officers in real-world scenarios. For example, he notes the inaccuracies, quote, incentivized to overutilize aircraft and to use them for relatively low quality missions where a cheaper alternative might serve better. Embedded in the piece is a breakdown of the costs of various aircraft, including the F-A-18. In particular, the Department of Defense's quoted hourly operating cost of around $11,000 does indeed include everything related to maintaining and flying the aircraft, except one critical and rather expensive thing, the initial cost of the jet itself, which is about $65 million per F-A-18. So why is this important when discussing cost per hour? Because each jet has a finite number of hours in its service life, about 6,000 hours. Thus, when you factor in the expected number of hours that each jet will be flown before it's scrapped or becomes a museum piece, that's an additional approximately $10,833 added to the cost of each hour of operation, thus about doubling the cost to just over $22,000 per hour for the FA-18. Going back to Hollywood films, in terms of reimbursement rates for Top Gun Maverick non-training hours, that would mean the studio is only paying about half the real cost per hour for the F-A-18. And just as a brief aside for how silly these numbers can get and why it's so important for commanders to be aware of the real numbers when optimally utilizing resources for a given mission, Odom notes that the F-22 Raptor, which the Department of Defense listed at $33,538 per hour when factoring in unit cost, is closer to about $60,000 per hour, and the F-35 is closer to about $50,000 per hour. So going back to Top Gun Maverick, it's reported that they filmed 813 hours of aerial footage in the F-A-18s for the film. Now, it's not clear from the quotes from Kaczynski whether that's 813 total flight hours, which would seem extremely excessive, or more likely that they shot 813 hours of total flight footage from all cameras used during the flights. As for how many cameras were used, if you're curious, Kaczynski states there were six cameras inside the cockpit, four looking at the actor at different angles, and two cameras looking forward. He also states that there were cameras mounted on the exterior of the jet and more cameras filming from the ground. But he does not specify exact numbers on this, other than to state that at their peak they had 26 total cameras rolling between two jets flying and ground cameras. And further than that, when you have two fast-moving objects, when you have moments when the footage is good, you're going to get one or two second pieces worthy of being in the film. In a 40 hour day, 30 seconds was great. 
Another vital piece of information for tallying things up that we don't have here is how many of these flight hours were counted as training or not. This could be anything from the pilot's need to train in some specific environment or maneuver to just simply getting needed hours in towards their general flight requirement time. But whatever these totals are, to sum the costs up, it would seem that in the general case, the studio had to pay a set rate for the equipment and personnel they used outside of things that could be chalked up to training in order to, in theory, not cost the US taxpayer anything they wouldn't have already had to pay. Pay for. Except, as noted, the hourly rate charged for non training FA 18 hours it would seem about half of that of the real cost of $22,000 when adding in the cost of the initial purchase of the jet itself. Thus, on the surface, it seems to cost the US taxpayer quite a lot, actually, even if not discussing potentially how generous or not the Department of Defense was being with oh, what it qualified as training. All of this said, however, there are other factors that might still see this as a steal of a deal for the Department of Defense's general budget and for the taxpayer. And that comes down to recruiting and the rather astronomical amount that the Department of Defense spends just to recruit a single person to some branch of the military, not even talking bonuses and things of that nature to the person, just the cost of staff and expenses to do the recruiting in the first place. On that one, for reference, as tallied up by Rate the Military, an organization set on helping to improve military recruitment efforts, the various branches of the U.S. military combined to spend an average of $18,000 per recruit. These costs come from things like advertising and maintaining about 15,000 staff members, among other operational costs of their recruitment efforts. And for reference here, the US military, including all branches, generally tries to recruit roughly 200,000 people to fill their ranks per year. Thus, while allowing their personnel and equipment to be used in films that paint the military in a positive light and encourage recruitment may not come out of the normal recruitment budgets, it is generally seen as doing just this, and even if being super generous about what counts as training and giving studios a bargain deal on the use of equipment outside of that, it still comes at a drastically cheaper rate compared to normal advertising and recruitment methods that the Department of Defense otherwise uses. Thus, or potentially actually saving the US taxpayer money, even if it's accurate to say that they aren't, for example, being correctly compensated for the use of all those FA-18 flight hours in a film like Top Gun Maverick. For example, going back to the cost per hour of the FA-18, when factoring in the cost of the jet itself, even if we wanted to be wildly inaccurate and say all 813 hours of aerial footage were literally 813 hours of flying and not hours compiled from multiple cameras in the same flights, and even if on top of that we said the Department of Defense chalked up every single one of those hours to train and really shouldn't have, and using the correct $22,000 per hour figure factoring in the cost of the jet, that wildly overinflated figure is still just shy of only $18 million spent. This is a lot of taxpayer money, certainly, but at average cost per recruit numbers, that would mean Top Gun Maverick would only need to recruit an additional thousand or so people from its debut to forever to recoup that cost, with anything after that actually saving the taxpayer money. And given inflation rates and things like that, it looks even better. As some kid watching the movie in 10 years might decide to join up, well, that's much cheaper than it would be at the future rate. And the movie is out there, and it will be watched for decades to come. Again, an absolute steal of a deal for the Department of Defense. And given the Department of Defense notes that they have been struggling mightily in recent years to get the number of recruits they need and thus having to continually increase advertising budgets and the like, this is potentially huge. As Major General Ed Thomas of the Air Force Recruitment Service notes, it's a math problem. The national labor shortage is driving millions of unfilled jobs. The nation is bigger. The military is smaller. Few people today know someone who has served. Eligibility to serve has dropped to just 23% due to obesity, medical or other issues, and less people are generally knowledgeable enough about the military to know what a great way of life serving in the military can be. Of course, this is only a steal of a deal if it actually causes people to sign up for the military. So, the big question is, does it? In most cases, that simply isn't measurable in any definitive way. Despite studies attempting to do so, such as Linsky Vazarevsky's 2022 economics thesis, a study of the impact of US Department of Defense and movie industry cooperation on military application rates. That said, in a case like Top Gun, this is often cited to be a rare example where the spike in recruitment after, especially for the US Navy and Air Force, was so high that it's just blatantly obvious. Except, as we alluded to at the beginning of this piece, while you'll often read the Navy saw a 500% increase in recruitment the year Top Gun came out, this isn't accurate at all, nor in the years after. And the actual increase appears to have only been about 8%, which, to be fair, given how much the Department of Defense spends on recruitment, seems to be like a massive spike, and it made Top Gun well worth their time, even on year one. Except 
Here's the thing. While recruitment did go up by 8% as noted, what also went up was the Department of Defense's spending on recruitment. In 1984, for example, it had a $13.1 million advertising budget, which then jumped to $19.9 million in 1985, and in 1986, when Top Gun came out in May of that year, it was at $31 million, more than double two years before, and up 36% from the previous year, which again saw an 8% increase. We should also probably point out here that the significant rise in recruitment trend had actually started in 1984 and 1986 and beyond for a bit was just a continuation of that trend. Not just that, as reported in a 1986 edition of the New York Times covering US military recruitment, they also point out that the Navy had not just massively increased advertising year over year leading up to Top Gun, but also that year almost tripled the number of recruiters they had across the United States. They also began implementing a new plan offering $18,800 for college for anyone who served two years plus another four in the reserves. Again, all for an 8% boost. Further, for whatever it's worth, as Air Force Recruiting Services spokesman Leslie Brown states, at least on their end, on any sort of spike from the original Top Gun, we can't find in the Air Force where that's true. That said, it is pointed out that a positive perception of the military and soldiers is always going to help recruiting, whether this is measurable for a given outlet for that like Top Gun or not. And arguably, the individuals who might have been most inspired by Top Gun to perhaps join the military would be children, with the effect of not coming until potentially many years later and being effectively unmeasurable no matter how much you look at the data. So this brings us back to the original question. So did the original Top Gun actually have any real effect on recruitment, or was it just the increase in spending on recruitment and massive increase in recruiters and added benefits that did it? Or going further, was it something of every business manager's favorite term, synergy between the two? For what it's worth, anecdotal accounts from countless pilots who did sign up note their early interest in doing so came about from watching Top Gun. For example, spokesman for the US Naval Air Forces, Commander Ronald Flanders states, If you talk to a lot of the senior pilots in the Navy today, the captains and admirals, many of them attribute their interest in naval aviation today to the original release of that film. Except it does beg the question of whether they perhaps were already invested in flying or the military or would have become anyway because of their inherent inclinations to such. And thus movies like Top Gun would naturally appeal to them. But even if they had not existed, they probably would have become interested in flying anyway and may have gone down the same path as the military is one of the best ways to even just become a commercial pilot someday. After all, you'd perhaps have to be not the sharpest tool in the shed if you thought depictions in movies like Top Gun accurately represent what real life as a military pilot is and want to join because of it, which beyond, especially in the original Top Gun, countless things that would have seen you grounded permanently, such as the whole buzzing the tower thing, mostly life as a real military pilot is pretty mundane. As former FA-18 weapon systems officer Joe Rasica states, if anyone were to make a movie about real life jet jocks, it would be boring as hell. The mundane outpaces the thrills by about 100 to 1. You think you get bored with your daily routine of eating, sleeping, and sitting behind a computer? Try doing it for seven months at a time while trapped on an aircraft carrier with 5,000 of your closest friends. Commander Ronald Flanders further chimes in of the reality of being a fighter pilot in today's military. Most of the aviation fighting is either providing eyes in the sky or occasionally dropping bombs on target. Very little of it is the glamorous air warfare that you see in Top Gun. That's not to mention that even the types of personalities depicted are the polar opposite of what, for example, the Top Gun program is looking for, as elaborated on by former Top Gun commanding officer Christopher Papiano. If they come in confident, overconfident, and cocky, that's not a personality that you can make better. They instead look for pilots who are, to quote, humble, who can go do an event, make a big comeback, recognize that they've made some mistakes, and be willing to critique themselves or allow us as instructors to make them better. Former Navy instructor pilot Jim Gibbeau further states, nobody wants to risk their lives around a loose cannon no matter how good they are at certain things. There's even a term for this, NAFOD, no apparent fear of death. These are the ones who'll get you killed with their recklessness. Now, sadly, you're almost never going to get a cool call sign like Iceman or Maverick either, with your call sign likely to be the most embarrassing thing that your fellow pilots can come up with about you or something they witnessed you doing, informing what would ultimately be your call sign, with many simply being not family friendly enough to repeat. As former naval pilot Chris Petrox succinctly states, the thing that locks in the call sign is if the guy doesn't like it. Or as the aforementioned Joe Rizzica notes of the pilots in the Top Gun films, the most attractive people in flight suits you've ever seen. Trust me on the last part. When you serve with guys who look like their call signs, pigger, butthead, no one would pull them out of central casting. Thus, again, all coming back to that it's unlikely anyone is going to be truly convinced to enlist just because of something they saw in even the coolest of films like Top Gun and somehow the even cooler Top Gun Maverick. Thus, once again, while many a pilot or former pilot in some branch of the US military may have been of the so-called Top Gun generation and inspired by the film, it may well be that movies like Top Gun simply appealed to them because of their pre-existing inclinations and interests, and thus they may have been likely to sign up anyway. However, as alluded to, direct inspiration isn't needed here. To make the 
these films a benefit to recruitment. There is something to be said for a general increase in public perception of the US military and the benefits that that has on recruitment and the lives of the soldiers themselves. That's not to mention even as something of a propaganda tool abroad, generally making the US military look so dominant that you'd not want to mess with them. And at least for what it's worth, the Department of Defense definitively thinks that these sorts of films are both great for public perception of the military and great recruitment tools worth making their equipment and personnel available for filming, so long as the military is painted in a reasonably positive light and it's reasonably accurate to reality in terms of how personnel would conduct themselves, at least ideally, given set policy. Humans are going to human, of course, and like every job, there are people who do it well and people who don't exactly live up to the normal standards of conduct. Or sometimes just a seemingly systemic bit of bad behavior that needs corrected right quick, such as the Navy's infamous tailhook scandal in which a group of Marines and Navy personnel allegedly sexually assaulted as many as seven men and 83 women in one night in a hotel in Las Vegas. Naturally, this resulted in some pretty sweeping and very long overdue and needed reforms. And to their credit, in recent years, the Department of Defense has supported some films and documentaries that depict such, as noted by the aforementioned Colonel Allen. We've done projects like The Invisible War, a 2012 American documentary film about some difficult, tough subjects like sexual assault in the military. It's not an easy thing to watch, and it's not an easy thing to talk about, but it's an important discussion. Speaking of rather uncomfortable topics, this brings us back to the benefits to the military on the public perception front, which, depending on your particular viewpoint, may constitute propaganda or not in a given case. As George Washington University Law School professor Jonathan Turley points out, propaganda denotes a certain product, a packaged news account or film developed by a government or an organization to shape opinion. Yet this is not traditional propaganda, since the military does not generate the product itself and does not compel others to produce it. Rather, it achieves the same result through indirect influence. Influence, securing tailored historical accounts by withholding important resources. Semantics aside, even if one does consider this pure propaganda, there is something to be said for countering negative perception often put forth by the news, which generally has little interest in balanced reporting and is incentivized to report the bad actors and negative events in the military. For example, you're not going to see on the evening news a story of a US soldier saving some random life in some faraway place, but rather you'll hear about things like the tailhook scandal or the atrocities committed by the US in the Abu Ghraib prison and others during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The news is also more likely to report report on things like suicide rates of soldiers, post-traumatic stress disorder, subsequent alcohol and drug abuse, etc., rather than the number of soldiers who, after completing their service, use the self-discipline and many skills they learn during their time in the military, along with potential provided educational funding, to go and make a great life for themselves and their family directly because of their time in the U.S. military. This negative side and controversy being more or less synonymous with news to get those sweet, sweet clicks instead of accurately portraying things in an objective manner overall. Thus, the military has a vested interest in getting a slightly more accurate, if also occasionally whitewashed on the other end of the spectrum view of reality of the military and life in it out there. As the aforementioned liaison officer Todd Bresciale states of military support for films in this way, there's a lot to be said about the necessity to educate the American public about the military they're paying for. That said, as noted by cinema studies and cultural theory professor Alyssa Wilkinson, in the future, when those involved have passed away and our cultural relationship to the truth has only gotten more corrupted, how will we assess the truth about the ethically murky wars of the past several decades? Even if we know the facts and the film differ, will we care? What does it mean if the military has the financial power to say what version of history gets made? Countering that, Bresciale argues, there have been academics, very serious academics, who've written books about this sort of thing, who believe that any support whatsoever to the motion picture industry is necessarily propaganda. I just can't get there. I can't get my head around it, because it's not a black and white issue. Back again on the other side, showing his own concern, the aforementioned author David Robb states, the military is part of the US government. In America, we have the First Amendment, which prohibits government from favoring speech it likes and not favoring speech it doesn't like. You can't reward somebody who makes a movie saying how great the American government government is and deny the same break to somebody criticizing it. The military are not filmmakers. They're good at making war and making weapons, but they're not good at making movies. They don't have a sense of humor, and they don't really even have a sense of their own history. Going back once again on the other side, it's also noted that beyond any perception problem, asking any member of the military to portray their work and their fellow soldiers in a negative light, especially when talking historical things, which may not be at all how the military does things these days, but nonetheless is going to cast themselves in a negative light in public perception anyway, isn't exactly a fair ask on an individual level. Nor would many taxpayers be happy if their money is being used to paint the US in a negative light, especially in many cases where it isn't historically accurate to reality and how the military would do. 
or did things. Once again, as Bresciali states, it's not a black and white issue, which I think is something we can all agree on. And indeed, almost never is anything black and white, not even real world representations of the color black and white, with people literally working tirelessly to make blacker blacks and whiter whites on screens and in paints and stuff like that. So how about we finish today's video off with some bonus Top Gun facts, because it's not long enough already. Despite having his pilot's license since 1994, no, Tom Cruise did not get to fly any of the scenes he was in in the FA-18 or even touch the controls at all, other than the switch to activate the cameras the studio had installed. This is owing to Department of Defense rules that forbid to quote, non-military personnel from controlling a Defense Department asset other than small arms in training scenarios. That said, he did get to fly in the scenes at the end, flying around in the World War II era few million dollar P-51 Mustang. As to why on this one, it's because he's an adult and nobody could stop him because, well, it's his plane. His Mustang was originally built in 1946, ultimately finding its way into life as a museum piece in Illinois before being restored in 1997 and purchased by Cruise in 2001. He's been flying it ever since. No word on whether the studio compensated him on his flight hours on that one, although given his reported 10% cut of the gross of the film, which earned $1.5 billion, we're guessing either way he's not too upset. He's also not going to have to sell his Gulfstream 4, which apparently has a jacuzzi in it. Because, well, why wouldn't you? Moving on from there, how about how realistic it was that Maverick absolutely destroyed his students in Top Gun Maverick? Former Top Gun senior instructor Dave Burke rings in on this, saying it's very accurate. Quote, the most proficient instructor is significantly better than the most proficient student. Like, a big, big, big difference. As for why, this just comes down to the instructors practice the scenarios over time massively more than the pilots taking the extra training at the school. Former Top Gun instructor Guy Snagra also concurred, stating that when he was being evaluated to become an instructor himself at Top Gun after graduating the course, he was likewise handily outmaneuvered and shot down by his instructor and figured he did poorly on the tests because of it. But not so, with his evaluator stating to him after, no one ever beats their instructor. And uh, where they felt he shines, and far more important to them, was his analysis of what he had done wrong and how he could improve next time. They were also in general evaluating his character and temperament in those defeats, all of which, in his case, were deemed ideal to become an instructor. There. Once again, illustrating the importance of finding pilots who are extremely teachable and willing to learn, rather than the more hotshot, overly confident maverick types whose egos often get in the way of real improvement, and their rule breaking a major liability to their fellow service members and respective missions. Moving on from there, going back to the agreement between the US military and the studio for Top Gun Maverick, if you know anything about the F 14 Tomcat, you're probably wondering where they got one flying, given the US military doesn't have that amazing jet anymore. And indeed, nobody has a flying one except for Iran, which, owing to sanctions, the film studio couldn't use. So, how did the studio handle all of this for the film? In the agreement, it states that the F-14 shown during the ground scenes was borrowed from the National Naval Aviation Museum and that they approved repaint the aircraft with the NNAM approved paint scheme, remove ejection seats for on-stage filming, and conduct maintenance to power aircraft, have control panel and exterior lights operational in support of filming. All costs related to transporting, painting, and maintenance are the production company's sole expense. And if you're wondering here, the flight shots in the film showing the F-14 were sadly all computer generated. So that's it for today's video. Please don't forget to check out our wonderful sponsor, World of Warships. Click the link in the description below and use the code WARSHIPS to get your exclusive rewards, including doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a ship. And thank you for watching.